The Sound of Waves, Chapter 7. The day came for Shinji's brother, Hiroshi, to go on the school excursion. They were to tour the Kyoto Osaka area for six days, spending five nights away from home. This was the way the youths of Utajima, who had never before left the island, first saw the wide world outside with their own eyes, learning about it in a single gulp. In the same way, schoolboys of an earlier generation had crossed by boat to the mainland and stared with round eyes at the first horse-drawn omnibus they had ever seen, shouting, Look, look, a big dog pulling a privy. The children of the island got their first notions of the world outside from the pictures and words in their school books rather than from the real things. How difficult then for them to conceive, by sheer force of imagination, such things as streetcars, tall buildings, movies, subways. But then, once they had seen reality, once the novelty of astonishment was gone, they perceived clearly how useless it had been for them to try to imagine such things, so much so that at the end of long lives spent on the island, they would no longer even so much as remember the existence of such things as streetcars clanging back and forth along the streets of a city. Before each school excursion, Yashiro shrined the thriving business in talismans. In their everyday lives, the island women committed their own bodies as a matter of course, to the danger and the death that lurked in the sea. But when it came to excursions setting forth for gigantic cities they themselves had never seen, the mothers felt their children were embarking on great, death-defying adventures. Hiroshi's mother had brought two precious eggs and made him a lunch of terribly salty fried eggs. And deep in his satchel, where he wouldn't quickly find them, she had tucked away some caramels and fruit. On that day alone, the island's ferry boat, the Kamikaze Maru, left Utajima at the unusual hour of one in the afternoon. Formerly, the stubborn old-timer who captained this put-put launch of something under 20 tonnes had refused, as an abomination, any departure from the established schedule. But then had come the year when his own son went on the excursion. Ever since then, he'd understood what, what they meant by saying the children would squander their money if the boat got to Toba too much ahead of time for their train to leave, and had grudgingly agreed to let the school authorities have their own way with the schedule. The cabin and the deck of the Kamikaze Maru were overflowing with schoolboys, satchels and canteens hanging across their breasts. The teachers in charge were terror-stricken by the swarm of mothers on the jetty. On Utajima, a teacher's position depended on the disposition of the mothers. One teacher had been branded a communist by the mothers and driven off the island, while another, who was popular with the mothers, had even gotten one of the women teachers pregnant and still been promoted to that to be acting assistant principal. It was the early afternoon of a truly spring-like day, and as the boat set sail, every mother was screaming the name of her own child. The boys, with the straps of their student caps fixed under their chins, waited until they were sure their faces could no longer be distinguished from the shore, and then began to yell back in high-spirited fun, Goodbye, stupid! Hooray, you old goose! To hell with you! The boat, jam-packed with black student uniforms, kept throwing reflections of metal cap badges and polished buttons back to shore until it was far out at sea. Once Hiroshi's mother was back, sitting at the straw mats of her own house, gloomy and deadly quiet, even in the daytime, she began weeping, thinking of the day when both her sons would finally leave her for good and take to the sea. The Kamikaze Maru had just discharged its load of students at the Toba Pier opposite Mikimoto's Pearl Island, and, regaining its usual happy-go-lucky, countrified air, was preparing for the return crossing to Utajima. There was a bucket atop the ancient smokestack, and water reflections were playing over the underside of the prow and over the great creels hanging from under the pier. A grey go-down stood looking out across the sea, with the large white character for ice painted on its side. Chiyoko, the daughter of the lighthouse keeper, was standing at the far end of the pier holding a Boston bag. This unsociable girl, returning to the island after a long absence, disliked having the islanders greet and speak to her. 
Chiyoko never wore a trace of makeup, and her face was made all the more inconspicuous by the plain, dark brown suit she was wearing. There was something about the cheerful, slapdash way her dingy features were thrown together that might have appealed to some. But she always wore a gloomy expression and, in her constantly perverse way, insisted upon thinking of herself as unattractive. Until now, this was the most noticeable result of the refinements she was learning at the university in Tokyo. But probably the way she brooded over her commonplace face as being so unlovely was just as presumptuous as if she had been convinced she was an utter beauty. Chiyoko's good-natured father had also contributed, unwittingly, to this gloomy conviction of hers. She was always complaining so openly that she had inherited her ugliness from him that, even when she was in the next room, the outspoken lighthouse keeper would grumble to his guests. Well, there's no doubt about this grown-up daughter of mine being homely. It really makes me sad. I'm so ugly myself that I guess I have to take the blame for it. But then, I suppose, that's fate. Someone clapped Chiyoko on the shoulder and she turned around. It was Yasuo Kawamoto, the president of the Young Men's Association. He stood there laughing, his leather jacket glistening in the sun. Oh, welcome home. Spring vacation, isn't it? Yes, exams were over yesterday. So, now we've come back to have another drink of mother's milk. The day before, Yasuo's father had sent him to attend to some business for the cooperative with the prefectural authorities at Tsu. He had spent the night at an inn in Toba run by relatives and now was taking the boat back to Utajima. He took great pride in showing this girl from a Tokyo university how well he could speak without any trace of island dialect. Chiyoko was conscious of the masculine joviality of this younger man her own age. His worldly manner seemed to be saying, there's no doubt but what this girl has a fancy for me. This feeling made her even more bad tempered. Here it is again, she told herself. Influenced both by her natural disposition and by the movies seen and novels read in Tokyo, she was always wishing that she could have a man look at her at least once with eyes saying, I love you, instead of, you love me. But she decided she would never have such an experience in all her life. A loud, rough voice shouted from the kamikaze Maru, Hey, where the blazes is that load of quilts? Somebody find them! Soon, a man came carrying a great bell of arabesque patterned quilts on his shoulders. They had been lying on the quay, half hidden in the shadows of the go-down. The boat's about ready to leave, Yasuo said. As they jumped from the pier to the deck, Yasuo took Chiyoko's hand and helped her across. Chiyoko thought how different his iron-like hand felt from the hands of men in Tokyo. But in her imagination, it was Shinji's hand she was feeling, a hand she'd never even so much as shaken. Peering down through the small hatchway into the murky passenger cabin, all the more darkly stagnant to their daylight accustomed eyes, they could barely make out from the white towels tied around their necks or the occasional flickering reflection from a pair of spectacles, the forms of people lolling on the straw matting. It's better on deck, even if it's a bit cold, it's still better. Yasuo and Shioko took shelter from the wind behind the wheelhouse and sat down, leaning against a coil of rope. The captain's snappish young helper came up and said, Hey, how about lifting your asses for a minute? With that, he pulled a plank out from under them. They'd sat down on the hatch used for closing the passenger cabin. Up in the wheelhouse, where scruffy, peeling paint half revealed the grain of wood underneath, the captain rang the ship's bell. The kamikaze Maru was underway. Surrendering their bodies to the shuddering of the ancient engine, Yasuo and Chiyoko gazed back at Toba's receding harbour. Yasuo very much wanted to drop a hint about how he had slipped off and bought himself a piece last night, but decided he'd better not. If he'd been a boy from an ordinary farming or fishing village, his experience with women would have been cause for boasting. But on straight-laced Utajima, he had to keep his mouth tightly shut. Young as he was, he'd already learned to play the hypocrite. Chiyoko was betting with herself as to the instant when a seagull would fly even higher than the still tower of the cableway that ascended the mountain behind Toba Station. 
this girl who, out of shyness, had never had any sort of adventures in Tokyo, had been hoping that when she returned to the island, something wonderful would happen to her, something that would completely change her world. Once the boat was well away from Toba Harbour, it would be an easy matter for even the lowest flying goals to seem to rise higher than the receding steel tower. But right now, the tower was still soaring high in the air. Chiyoko looked closely at the second hand of her wristwatch, fastened with its red leather strap. If a seagull flies higher than that within the next 30 seconds, that will mean something wonderful really is waiting for me. Five seconds passed. A seagull that had come following alongside the boat suddenly flew high into the air, flapping its wings, and rose higher than the tower. Afraid that the boy at her side might remark on her smile, Chiyoko broke her long silence. Is there any news on the island? The boat was passing Sakate Island to port. Yasuo's cigarette had become so short it was burning his lips. He crushed the butt out on the deck and answered, Nothing in particular. Oh, yes, the generator was broken down until ten days ago and the whole village was using lamps. But it's fixed now. Yes, my mother wrote me about that. Ah, she did? Well, as for any more news... Yasuo narrowed his eyes against the glare of the sea, which was overflowing with the light of spring. The coast guard cutter, Hiyodori Maru, was passing them at a distance of about ten yards, sailing in the direction of Toba. Oh, I forgot. Uncle Terumiata has brought his daughter back home. Her name's Hatsu, and she's a real beauty. So? Chiyoko's face had clouded at the word beauty. Just the word alone seemed an implied criticism of her own looks. I'm a great favourite of Uncle Teru's, all right. And there's my older brother to carry on our own family. So everybody in the village is saying I'm sure to be chosen for Hatsu's husband and adopted into her family. Soon the Kamikaze Maru had brought Suga Island into view to starboard and Toshi Island to port. No matter how calm the weather, once a boat passed beyond the protection of these two islands, high running waves would always set the boat's timbers to creaking. From this point on, they saw numerous cormorants floating in the wave troughs and farther out to sea, the many rocks of oaky shallows projecting up above the water. Yasuo knitted his brows and averted his eyes from the sight of oaky shallows, the reminder of Utajima's one and only humiliation. Fishing rites in these shallows where the blood of Utajima's youth had been shed in ancient rivalries had now been restored to Toshi Island. Chiyoko and Yasuo got to their feet and, looking across the low wheelhouse, waited for the shape of an island that would soon appear in the ocean before them. As always, Utajima rose from the level of the sea shaped like some amorphous, mysterious helmet. The boat tilted and the helmet seemed to tilt with it.